Our next presenter is gonna be Mr. Don Tharp. Uh, Mr. Tharp is a graduate of Abilene High School and he has a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry and a Master's in Organic Chemistry from Abilene Christian University. He's worked as a chemistry and physics instructor at Cisco College and he was a supervisor for the City of Abilene Health Department and the Texas Water Commission as a registered sanitarian, concentrating in surface water treatment and solid waste programs. Don has worked for the TNRCC slash TCEQ in solid waste wastewater and public drinking water program since 1993, retiring in March of 2011. He is currently consulting with the TCEQ Texas Optimization Program in areas such as regulatory records reviews, data audits, monitoring, process control, and laboratory instruction, including filter assessments and plant startup assistance. So give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that introduction. And as you can see, all of that hassle over the past few years has given me a whole lot of gray hair, I'll tell you for sure. Well, today I want to talk about, the, the, the title of the subject is, is uh, Troubleshooting the Surface Water Treatment Plant. I uh, had the good fortune to be a part of that startup crew uh, when we started the optimization program, 1995. Uh, and what you're going to see today is a lot of the things that I have taken pictures of or I've experienced while we have been doing these MCPEs throughout the state, throughout the uh, years that I worked with that particular program. Uh, basically, it's gonna be a tour of a surface water treatment plant. And I'm always a little hesitant to uh, talk to you all because I'm talking to a room full of operators that know way more about water treatment than I do because you live it 24 seven every day and particularly at your particular plant and at your particular water. But I have seen quite a few problems in some of these areas in a water treatment plant. And uh, it may give you some ideas as we go through and take a look at each one of these uh, uh, facilities. Intakes. Well, we always want to start off at the lake. And the things that we want to talk about when we look at intakes are particularly what type of intake <clears throat> that you may have. Uh, there are various kinds and types of intakes. There's intakes that are located on the bank, uh, offshore intakes, there's intakes on piers, floating intakes, uh, variable level intakes, fixed level intakes. Uh, it's important what type of intake you have and, and whether or not it's functional mechanically. If it's a multi-layer, uh, level intake, can you open all the gates or not open all the gates? Is the bottom half the intake silted in or is it not? That kind of thing. We're always interested in the raw water pumps as to what type you have and the size and capacity that uh, is available at the intake. It's always interesting to uh, look at the pretreatment that takes place in and around the intakes. and. Uh, I have a propensity to stop and tell war stories, as some of you in the room are well aware, uh, which means I probably will not get through this whole presentation, but sometimes the war stories are worth listening to. Uh, I have two about pretreatment. You know, in the old days, when we could use chlorine as an oxidant, uh, we chlorinated at the intakes, uh, both for disinfection protocols and and to chemically take care of those things that could be oxidized out of the water, which uh, simplified our treatment process at the treatment plant considerably. But when we lost the ability to use chlorine as an oxidant, we had to go to other, other things. Primarily, uh, the, the two things that you see most often, or I see most often, are chlorine dioxide as an oxidant, and permanganate, either potassium permanganate or sodium permanganate. Um, two interesting stories about, about that. What can go wrong with a chlorine dioxide unit? Well, first of all, as my friends in the back row back there tell me, you have to really be a pretty good technician to run a chlorine dioxide unit. Uh, I worked with a small plant uh, that is no longer operating, but when they set up their chlorine dioxide unit, uh, they kept having some real issues with it. They couldn't get it to run more than about maybe two or three weeks at a time. 
and then they had to pull some real maintenance on it to get it back into shape. And uh, they couldn't really figure out what the problem was. So one day, their, one of their maintenance men came in and said, say, we had a water line break going to the chlorine dioxide unit. He said, so I had to uh, look for another water source. And he said, so I hooked it up to uh, the treated water line coming from the distribution system. They had been trying to run that chlorine dioxide with raw water from the lake. Well, it clabbered up the reaction chamber, uh, completely solidified it in. So no, it wouldn't work for more than about two weeks, which meant that until they could get a technician from Dallas-Fort Worth, which was tough to do uh, at times, back in there to repair that chlorine dioxide, well, they lost their oxygen. So it was really a, an issue. Uh, permanganate is another issue. If you overfeed permanganate, uh, it works well for taking out iron and manganese and taste and odor issues. But if you overfeed with permanganate, you can end up with uh, manganese dioxide and even soluble manganese coming through your plant. Soluble manganese and manganese dioxide is a little tough to get out of the water. When it, when it oxidizes, uh, the, permang the uh, manganese dioxide comes out as a very fine particulate material. And it doesn't tend to, I call it clabber up. <laughs> it doesn't come and make a, a very big particle. So it stays in suspension. And it's small enough that if you don't get it settled out in the uh, sed basin, it'll go right through your filters into your distribution system. And you will have some issues with permanganate. I have seen water in a, I'm working with a plant now, and uh, in their permanganate season that they think they have, they're, they've had water come out of taps as black as that curtain on that table. And that does tend to upset the customer somewhat. <laughs> so, and it was interesting in that these folks, uh, they kept telling me, Don, we only have it from September to about the end of December, which is a little strange, but that's what they tell me. Well, their intake is right flush with the bottom of the lake. And we have a, a program in, in the TCEQ called the Squigum program, Surface Water Quality Monitoring Units. They happen to have a uh, sample site located right on top of these people's intake. The intake's in about 90 foot of water, according to them. Every reading that those people have taken when they're monitoring this lake has shown that that intake is located in an, an anoxic zone. That means a zone where there is no oxygen. Um, when that happens, you have a lot of soluble iron and manganese in there. And they have it year round. They don't have it just three months of the year, it's year round. The reason they didn't know it is the only test kit they had looked at the uh, high level manganese, didn't look at the low level manganese. So, you know, when the bad symptom like the black water went away, in their opinion, the manganese issue went away. But they have it all the time. We're working on educating those folks. So you've got to be real careful about pretreatment when you're at the, I've seen uh, uh, permanganate units catch on fire because of improper storage of oils and whatnot at the uh, location where the permanganate feeder was. Uh, other things that you do at an intake carbon, sometimes it's fed at a raw water intake. That's an ungodly mess. Uh, so you don't really, if you can get away from it, you don't want to do that. Sample taps, let's talk about that for just a minute. Worked with a plant one time and they called me, sometimes you guys set me up. You know, I, you delight in that, it's showing, showing me how dumb I really am. Uh, they came and said, Don, we're trying to, trying to figure out our jar test procedure. And I'm a jar test guy. Okay, so, oh, you but I'm here, here I come, I'm ready. So they have a raw water tap in their laboratory. Their building and their laboratory is located maybe 100 yards, 200 yards away from the lake and from their intake. But they got this raw water tap in the lab. 
So Don takes all these samples and fills up the gator jars, and here we go, we're doing jar test, and I can't get a flock out of that water for anything. It just doesn't want to respond correctly. And I finally get kind of sick of it, and I said, hey, go get me a bucket of raw water out of the lake. So sure enough, they run down and get me a sample of raw water out of the lake. We fill it up, we're on the jar test, and it works beautifully. Hoorah, here, see this. But the question was, why didn't the water from the sample tap work, you know? So we had to scratch our heads about that for a while. Well, they came back and told me a few months later that they dug that line up and replaced it. And what they found was that that line was completely full of Asian clams. Well, now, Asian clams are what? Filter feeders. So I wasn't treating raw water from the lake. I was treating water that had run through a pretty efficient filter system. And as a result, had an issue with jar testing, you know. So uh, sample taps and their location can become very important in, in trying to ascertain what your treatment process is going to be all about. And then, of course, we're always interested in, excuse me, I'm, I'm from West Texas and I'm not used to the Austin atmosphere yet, so I may stop and have to uh, <laughs> take care of some business here as we go. Uh, we're always interested in what kind of things you have on the watershed around these lakes uh, because they can affect the water quality uh, considerably uh, when you're trying to bring water into a plant. Things like uh, agricultural uh, activities particularly, uh, cattle feeding operations tend to mess up a lake pretty, pretty bad sometimes. Uh, Recreational use, uses, you, you got to keep the boats away, so far away from the intake ramps and all that. And there's regulations about that. And since I retired, I purposely forgot about all the regulations I ever knew. That's why we have people like Katie here to keep us all straight. Boats dumping their potties in the lake. <laughs> That's kind of a disgusting thing, but it happens. There has to be some kind of regulation about that. Residential issues. I know of a lake up around Wichita Falls that had a rich a residential issue, uh, place around it. And they didn't have a wastewater system and they weren't hooked up to a wastewater system. Everybody had septic tanks. And the soils up there is not very conducive to that. Matter of fact, I have walked across some of their backyards. They, they built these little retaining walls under their fences, you know, to make them all look all nice and pretty. And that walking in that yard was like walking on a trampoline. It was that saturated. And uh, we've run uh, a series of tests along the shoreline of that lake, taking back tea samples and have demonstrated uh, in several instances where the septic tank overflows went right straight into the lake. So those are issues that you have to be able to address when you're talking about intakes and water sources. And uh, there's a war story that took off about 10 slides on the back end of this thing. Okay, <laughs> raw water meters, very, very important. There's two or three things that we're interested in when we talk about raw water meters. Uh, first of all, what kind is it? Does it function? <laughs> That's another big issue. Uh, you have to have one. If you're gonna treat water, you gotta know how much water is coming into the plant. Uh, this one happens to be a Venturi meter. Are you doing any chemical injection ahead of or around a raw water meter? That's of interest to us. Sometimes if you inject chemicals like caustic or you're trying to control pH, or if you're not careful and you don't have the proper injection with what you and I call uh, stingers, uh, engineers call them quills, am I right, <laughs> Lori? Uh, you can start particularly in West Texas, you can start uh, softening right at that point of injection, which can tend to screw up your raw water meter if it gets too bad. So you have to be careful of what chemicals you inject and just where you put them if you're walking around a, uh, a raw water meter. The other issue that we have quite often is return water. Many of the older plants brought their return water back in behind the raw water meters. Well, depending on how much return water you're taking out of your sedimentation ponds, uh, 
you can actually affect the flow such that you can affect your chemical dosage rates without knowing how much of that return water is coming back into the plant. And if it's sporadic on and off, as you take that decant water back into the plant, if you don't have a way of adjusting your chemical feed, then you can actually screw up your coagulation process and your uh, sedimentation process in the, in the clarifiers. So having that return water metered or having it uh, brought back in by, uh, ahead of the meters so that the actual flow of water that you're treating coming into the plant is pretty important. So the design and how you get that into the plant is of interest to us when we want to troubleshoot a plant. Uh, mixing. I, have, I can spend two hours on mixing alone, and I have a war story or two to tell here. But we're interested in the type of mixing. One of the plants that I used to work with out west of Abilene had serpentine mixers. Has anybody in here ever seen a serpentine mixer? You know what that is? It's just a long channel, concrete channel, that zips back and forth. And the turbulence of the water making those turns interjects enough energy so that you get mixing in the chemicals, serpentine mixers. Uh, that was back before Moses, you know. But, but they did have them, they did exist, and I did have an opportunity to see them. That's interesting. Mechanical mixing, uh, they, that can take several different forms. Uh, they can be cage-like mixers, or they can be impeller mixers, turbine mixers, uh, static inline mixers. Uh, those are designed to impart quite a bit of turbulence as the water flows through them. And it is the turbulence and the instant mixing of the chemicals that you're injecting that is of just magnitudes of importance when we're working about the, uh, talking about the treatment process. Um, Chemical feed and how do you feed them where in what order where they go? And again, it's kind of tied into the flash mixing or the chemical mixing. When we flash mix or when we chemically mix that water, we want that chemical to go throughout that column of water or throughout the, I call it a matrix being a chemist. But uh, we want it completely mixed and thoroughly mixed in that matrix or in that volume of water as soon as we can possibly get it there. And I will, I'll show you why here in just a second. And the other thing, of course, is sample taps. And, and there's been some changes. I don't know, I wasn't aware of this until about, oh, well, maybe six months ago. But in the monochloramine process now, you know, to control the monochloramine process, you have to know what your chlorine concentration is just prior to uh, the injection of ammonia. A lot of us don't stop to realize that almost all water has some kind of chlorine demand in it. So if you go to your rotor meters and say you're feeding 20 pounds of chlorine a day or 20 parts, because of your chlor chlorine demand, you may not have 20 parts of free chlorine right where you put your injection point. You may have 18 or 19 or whatever your demand is, you may have considerably less chlorine than you think you do. So when you come back in and try to inject your ammonia after your chlorine feed, if you're not in the right ratio, five to one for engineers or four to one for the rest of us, for the rest of the real world, uh, you can end up with an excess of ammonia in your water. And if you put an excess of ammonia out in your distribution system for very long, I'll guarantee you that you're gonna be doing a burnout sooner or later and you're gonna have some disinfection issues. So this control of the monochloramine process is very, very important. Well, what does that have to do with sample taps? Well, it turns out that as I understand it, now it's a regulatory issue that you take a chlorine residual reading between where you inject chlorine and where the ammonia feed is so that you know exactly what your chlorine residual is when you go to try to control the monochloramine process. So sample taps in and around where this flash mix is happening becomes pretty important, okay? Check me out on that. I'm, again, I'm not a regulatory guy, I'm a process control guy. That's really what I like to do. Uh, this is an example, <laughs> a couple of examples of a, 
This is a flash mix and a flocculator at a little plant that, that uh, really we were doing an MCP at. And if we show up for an MCPE, you know they got issues, okay? And I hope that I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. I may show you a picture of your old plant. If I do, I apologize. It's just a good example of what you might want to look for. The, well, this is a flash mix and flocculator. That's about all I want to say about it. I really want to move on to the next slide. I want to talk about mixing even more. This was an issue that we found in a plant over in East Texas. Noble Johnson and I were doing some work with them, trying to help them out. And this is a, 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 a feed line coming from the clarifiers. It goes into the bottom of a trough. Uh, it goes up through the trough and, and the end of that line it actually terminates a little bit above the sidewater depth in that trough. Water spills out over it into this trough and then uh, on the sides there, are the uh, openings that go into the, into the various filters. He had a bank of three filters that he was feeding. It looks, on the schematic, it looks like this, okay? That's the way this thing was designed to work. Well, they, after thought, they thought, well, it'd be nice if we could inject a little caustic and maybe inject a little chlorine ahead of these filters, kind of controlled process. So they came in and tapped that line, and I guess they, you all call it saddle taps. And then they ran chlorine in on one side of that line and caustic in on the other. And while we were looking at this, the operator just made the comment. He said, you know, he said, I got to taking pH readings across the top of those filters. And he said, the pH readings in the, those filter boxes are all different. And Noble and I both go, what? <laughs> what? He said, yeah, I said it was so drastic that I really stopped feeding caustic because I didn't know what was going on. And uh, Noble and I immediately saw an opportunity to get involved. Uh, <laughs> so I said, well, what are you feeding? He said, I'm still feeding chlorine. So we took a chlorine test kit and we started testing chlorine residuals across the top of those three filters. And sure enough, the chlorine residuals were considerably different between the three filters. And uh, as a matter of fact, the filter over on your right side, I think it was a filter number one, that filter had no chlorine residual in the top of the filter at all. And this is one of their zones. Well, what happens if you lose chlorine in one of your zones? You lose credit for that in calculation for your disinfection credit. So it was a serious matter. So we wanted to, we kind of, needed to figure out what was going on. And uh, what happens is they fed that chlorine feed down there at the bottom, right at the side of the plant. Well, the flow going up that pipe was laminar flow, which uh, in the engineer speak, means the water's moving pretty slow. There's no turbulence in it whatsoever. But when you feed chemical into a flow, a stream of water, it it doesn't just all diffuse all at once. It diffuses in a cone of diffusion. Uh, as the water moves up and carries that chemical, that chemical diffuses out into the column of water and it does it in a cone shape if it's inside a pipe. Well, what was happening was that the chlorine was injected at the side of the pipe and as the pipe was so short and the flow so slow that there was no diffusion. So that little plume of chlorine went right up the left-hand side of that pipe, spilled over, and most of the chlorine went to the left, and none was going to the right. So there was no internal mixing where that water was, was thoroughly mixed or thoroughly disinfected with that chlorine going in there. So the way that you inject chemicals into the pipe, where you inject them, what kind of mixing energy that you impart to that uh, system it is very, very important. If you read the Pipsenberg manuals for jar testing, you will find that there's, there's graphs in there that says if you want to emulate your plant, you have to emulate the mixing energies in this jar test. So you have to know what your mixing energies are in your flash mix and in your flocculators or that jar test machine isn't worth a hill of beans. And that's why the old timers put it in the closet and never got it out 
because they didn't understand about mixing energies or emulating the processes in the plant. And as a result, what they got out of the jar test didn't mean anything to them in the process control, in the treatment process. So mixing energies and mixing times uh, are extremely important in the process control inside your plant. This is an example of a mechanical inline mixer. Uh, we're always interested again in what kind, whether you have a static mixer or mechanical or hydraulic. Uh, this one is in pretty good shape. Uh, the operator at this plant, matter of fact, this particular plant, some of you may recognize it, their clarifier turbidities are considerably less than what the regulatory requirement is for treated water going to town. Consistently. Uh, this plant's optimized and, and this operator, old West Texas guy, but he does a pretty good job with this water. Uh, the other thing that you see here is some uh, uh, injection ports on either side of that mixing uh, mixer. System down south of Abilene had a conventional surface treatment plant and they too had a handle on that plant. I could go into the plant and I say, hey guys, make me 0.5 water out of your clarifier. Those operators, if I give them enough time to go to the plant, they would make 0.5 water. They, they knew the plant, knew the water that well. Uh, they're good operators. Well, they went to some membrane plants uh, ahead of and beside that normal conventional plant. When they did, they put a huge transmission line between the membrane plant and their clear wells for future growth. But they wanted to uh, inject monochloramine in that transmission line. So they had a big vault in there and they had their ammonia feed in there and their chlorine feed in there. And they kept continually having issues trying to control the monochloramine process. Uh, that line was so big that again, we're back to laminar flow. And inside that block where the engineers designed the amount of space supposedly they were supposed to have, they didn't have, a mix, didn't have enough mixing energy in there to actually mix those plumes of chemical so that they got good production of the monochloramine. So the engineers came back and said, well, gosh, we can solve that. They bought them a couple of high dollar inline mixers like this one, only it, the design was such that rather than having chemical injection at the side, this was one of these mixers where they put the chemical down the center of the, of the, of the uh, shaft and the hollow shaft and the chemical was injected right uh, underneath the impellers. So, I mean, we got great mixing while it worked. But what happened was neither the engineers nor the contractors, I'm sorry, Laurie, I don't mean to be picking on y'all. <laughs> Laurie's an old, old friend and, and an engineer from way back. So <laughs> they forgot that in West Texas, our water's just a little bit hard. Okay, so here they come with that high concentration of ammonia and put it right in to that uh, high hardness water well, you, you operators know that if you do that with a quill, you better have one of them rubber expansions on there, or you better have a wrench so that you can take that quill out of there and clean it on a routine basis. Right? Am I wrong about that? I see some of you shaking heads, so I know I'm not lying too much. <laughs> so they forgot that. So after about a week and a half of operation, well, that high dollar mixer just clabbered completely up. And they, they replaced that thing two or three times before they figured out, hey, we can't do that. You know, <laughs> that's not working with this water. So it's important how you inject these chemicals around these mixers and where you, that's the bottom line for that story. It's a very important thing to do. If you're having problems, you probably ought to go out there and do a little troubleshooting to find out exactly what they ended up doing actually was moving their injection point, particularly for their chlorine, ahead of their membranes, which was considerable difference distance away. And then they, they worked on this injection point for uh, uh, ammonia and finally got it straightened out so that they could make a monochloramine residual to their clear wells and everybody was happy, happy, happy.
Let's talk about removal of, of some of the byproducts of our treatment process. That's, that's important, you know. Uh, you don't want to let that uh, clarifier actually get too deep in solids. I mean, it's not so much that, uh, you know, we don't worry about, and this is hard to explain, but not really. It's not that hard. We don't worry too much about the detention time in the clarifiers. Oh, there's regulatory requirements. It says you have to have so much. But what makes a clarifier work is not the detention time in it. It's what they call, what, what we call the surface overflow rate or the surface loading rate. It is the ratio of the flow of the water through that clarifier to the overall surface area because that affects the settling rate of the particles that you make. And that's what takes the, the clabbered up particles out of the flow of water. Well, you gotta do something with those solids. Uh, this is a, a picture of a, a, a backwash pond and, and a pond where they, when they do take solids out of the clarifier, they put it into these ponds, let it settle, take the decant water and head it back into the head of the plant. Well, after a, so long a period of time, those ponds tend to get clabbered up, okay? And if you don't come and take the sludges out of them, which is another issue you've got to worry about, you can keep sludges on site forever if you protect them from runoff. But if you have to haul them off, you have to have a permit. They got to go to a permitted site for disposal or a landfill or a wastewater plant, which means you got to deal with that bureaucracy to get rid of your solids. If you don't get rid of your solids, the water's gonna overflow and then you better have a discharge permit or you're gonna have the TCEQ on your neck about putting water down the bar ditch without a permit. So there's all kinds, you really gotta watch these solids. Uh, and that's what's happening in the bottom picture. They're, you know, they've dewatered that, that pit and the, the sludge truck's there and they're fixing to haul that off to a landfill and everything's wonderful, okay? And that's the way it's supposed to go. A very, very old sedimentation basin. Can you see the issue here? This basin was so old that it did not have a way to drain and take those solids out of there. So after a period of time, these operators had to look for some constructive way to, take, to get these solids out of the way so that their clarifier would continue to function and not go septic. That's the big problem with a clarifier. God, I inspected one one time and we walked down the side of it and it had this thing under the surface of the water that was going, ooly, 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 you know, just sitting there kind of oozing. And my contemporary picked up a tube before and reached over and poked on it. Well, he broke the layer of that thing and the most god awful bubble of hydrogen sulfide come out of there. You know, we had been playing good guy, bad guy with the <laughs> operator up until that point. And then we both went bad guy on the operator, you know. It took mud pumps to clarify. He hadn't drained that clarifier in God knows how long. And it took actual, we had to go to the oil patch and get mud pumps to get the solids out of that thing to get it straightened out. Well, these guys came up with a very, very innovative way to do this. They actually designed, and you see it down there in the lower right-hand corner. They designed a little floating raft and they put some, some sludge pumps <laughs> on that raft and then they pull it back and forth, up and down that clarifier, sucking the, the solids out of it. And that's why you see the little trails. That's a little end around clarifier uh, at this particular, or horseshoe clarifier is what I used to call it, uh, at that particular water treatment plant. Now, this gets even better. This story gets even better. Here we go. They suck it out of there and they pump it to these storage tanks, okay? Okay, they're storing their solids. That looks, that's, that's cool. He already knows where this story's going, don't you? You know what's going to happen when you put these solids in that tank. What's going to happen? They're going to settle and compact, right? Well, they can't keep putting them in there forever. They got to take them out of the, they got to take them out of the tank, right? So old Don prowls around and he takes a picture of this. There is the pump that's supposed to take the solids out of these tanks <laughs> and take it on to a, a, the next treatment. Yeah, I had the same reaction. <laughs> I said, good Lord Almighty, what in the world are these people thinking about? I mean, it looked good on paper, but my Lord, moving those solids after they settle in that tank and then trying to get rid of them, 
you know, you talk about troubleshooting deluxe. So I just had to find out where these were going. I could not leave it alone, okay? So I traced this discharge, and actually, they actually did get some water out of these tanks. Now, I don't know if they got sludge out of it, but they, they, they got water out of it because they took it to this. That's one of these geothermal bags, and it looked like the Pillsbury boy. <laughs> I mean, it was stuffed full. I didn't even want to dare to get close to it because I was afraid if I touched it, it was going to rupture. Uh, I know no tell, the, the theory was to get this thing full enough so that they could come and pick it up and haul it off. But Lord have mercy. Trying to get, trying to control the, you know, trying to control the solids. They, and they, he tried to do it in the best innovative way and in the cheapest way that they knew how. But boy, did they make a mess for themselves. Uh, and it's just something that you have to address when, when you're treating water. You're going to have byproducts that you're going to have to take care of. That's just a that's just the bottom line. Okay. Oh, what's next? Clarification. Boy, there's all kinds of clarifiers. As you well know, uh, there are conventional clarifiers of all shapes and sizes. There's uh, solids contact clarifiers. There's uh, blanket clarifiers. Upflow solids contact clarifiers. Regular upflow clarifiers. Not all. Conventional clarifiers are rectangular or square. Uh, sometimes they're round, which uh, if you have a pretty new investigator on your hands, they tend to confuse a round clear. If it's round, it's got to be a solid contact unit. That's just all there is to it. So it takes a few years for us to train them up so they kind of know what they're looking at. But there are all kinds of clarifiers. And what, what do you want to look at at a clarifier? Well, is there a special process involved with this clarifier? Is it a solids contact unit? Is it a, uh, a slurry recirculation type unit? You know, how do they recirculate? Is it external slurry recirculation or internal slurry recirculation? Is it mechanically sound? Is it working? Uh, believe it or not, I've seen solids contact upflow clarifiers with willow trees growing in the launderers. Now that tends to make you want to say there may be a problem here, you know? <laughs> and it's one of maintenance and upkeep primarily. Uh, controls, what kind of controls are on these clarifiers? And in the, in the older plants, most of the controls are gone. I mean, they got one speed, uh, particularly for the uh, slurry recirculation or internal slurry recirculation type units. Uh, that impeller that sits down in that column, that's not a mixer. That's in there to act as a pump. These clarifiers are designed to use that flow of water that that impeller and that pumping action impedes or imparts to the water to affect uh, effective flocculation inside the bell of that solid contact unit. Most of these clarifiers are designed, if you have a million gallon a day clarifier, most of these clarifiers are designed to have that mixing unit underneath that bell to recirculate. Oh, five minutes, God, I'm halfway through. Uh, most, of, most of those clarifiers are designed to, to operate between five to eight times the flow rate of the water coming into your clarifier, which means if you got a million gallon a day clarifier, that little pump in there circulating that water about six, seven million gallons a day. Now that's whistling. That's moving right along, but it takes that flow to impart the flocculation mixing energy underneath that bell so that your flocculation process completes and your solids stay in the tank and don't go to your filters, okay? Well, what can you find? Some of these clarifiers can be modified with uh, uh, tubes. Man, that's, that's slick. Some of them can be modified to go from uh, uh, solids contact upflow clarifiers to pulsators. Abilene did that uh, and have some really effective treatment process going on at their northeast plant. Uh, pretty slick uh, when they made that conversion. Sometimes when you call up, well, sometimes you get clarifiers that have this issue. Anybody, anybody, any of you got calf slobbers on the top of your clarifiers? Of course you do. Usually that's because of some kind of organics that come in 
to the plant and you're adding caustic for pH control, when you add caustic with certain organic acids, will you make soap? Well, if you make soap, you make calf slobbers, okay? <laughs> That's just the bottom line. So you have to do something about that. Usually it's called sprinklers uh, to break up the soap bubbles and allow the particles to, to precipitate. Sometimes when you go on top of a clarifier, you find this. Where's the motor? What's driving the shaft that's giving you circulation? The superintendent on this job took that motor off there to have it rewound. It had been gone for six months. You know, now what kind of clarification did he get? Three minutes. I'm moving on. Okay, here we go. Problems. See the problem with this? The operator swore and bedam that he had just emptied this clarifier of solids. And I had a tendency not to believe him. Now, the interesting thing about this clarifier is why, and these were side by side, these two, this two little clarifiers side by side. Sludge built up on the, on the left hand side on one of them, on the right hand side on the other. When water flows down a channel, the speed of the water tends to carry the water and all of its solids past the first inlet port. And when it hits the wall end of the other port, there's a pressure, dynamic pressure builds up on that port, so most of the solids tend to go into that clarifier. But because of the flow of water that through this single port, and they didn't have a diffusion baffle in there, uh, that water tended to go to one side of the clarifier, not the other, which tends to short circuit the clarifier, which tends to change the speed of the water, which tends to change the surface loading rate, which means that it doesn't work like it's supposed to, you know? So there's all kinds of issues that you can run into when you run into this kind of thing. And when you look at that problem, then you've got to identify, well, what do I got to do? You identify the problem, then you start looking for solutions. Then you change one thing at a time and see if you resolve the issue, okay? Ah, this is a clarifier. The sludge was built up to right underneath the launderers. Again, we had a maintenance issue here. I do want to spend just a minute here. The interesting thing about this one is the thing that imparts the circular motion in these solids contact units is how those gates are set on that outer ring that's around that, that central unit. Most of them in the old ones, the chain, those are held open the chain. You see where the gate is, where the water's coming into that outer ring? That ang it, the water hits that gate, it hits it at an angle and it imparts that circular motion to, for the mixing energy underneath the bell of that, of that skirt. Uh, most of those gates are standing wide open, which means there's no circular mixing energy, so they're not getting enough energy in there to affect effective flo flocculation. So it, it's an issue. Uh, they do this when they bring them down, repaint them. The guys forget to set the change back where the where the uh, manufacturer says to set them. So it's a it's a maintenance issue. Am I over ten? Uh, did you just give up on me, Katie? <laughs> Thirty seconds. I appreciate your time. I do have a few more slides. As a matter of fact, I only got halfway through. Uh, Miller did that to me on purpose because he knows I tell war stories. So what they did was give me one hour to do a two hour presentation and they gave it to me just before lunch. So if I don't quit and you miss your dinner, everybody in this room is going to be mad at me. <laughs> I appreciate your time and I love talking about this stuff. I'm sorry that I didn't have time to make the entire presentation. Maybe next time, maybe next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>